So this is John Costa at the Documentary Media Centre. It's day 11 of our 16 days of activism programme, which is a great way of ending the year. Um, been very busy so far, talking to lots of different people in the UK and overseas. Um, and today, overseas, Scotland, does that count as overseas Scotland, Sarah? Well, it's on the same landmass, isn't it? But it is a different country to England, particularly at the moment. So yes. yeah, for our, <laughs> for our, any anyone internationally watching this, I'm not quite sure border wise whether um you know we're we're joined uh, with Scotland or we're, we're going to be out. For, is England going to go on its own and stuff? You know, one of those great things with Brexit, isn't it? No one actually seems to know what's going on. But you never know; you exactly, might be independent yeah. one day. <laughs> true, true. But I was also just thinking because of the football at the moment, because obviously um, Scotland isn't in the World Cup whilst England is, and Wales were so. It is that kind of difference as well. Football. I, mean, they, they, I like the way sport brings us all together, but it kind of can drive us apart as well when it comes to England, Scotland, Ireland and Wales when it comes to football. So anyway, <laughs> listen, let me give, let me give you a full introduction, obviously. Yeah, Sarah Riley, uh, I've got here, disability rights advocate and co-founder and director at the Women's Research Centre, which is hosted by us here. A little shelf just over to my left-hand side here, but obviously all of the, the kind of, the day-to-day -day engagement with it and reaching out and advocacy and stuff is done by yourself. So, you know, thank you for joining me today for a, a oh, chat. Thank we you do for appreciate inviting it. me. That's all right. It's all right. Now, obviously, it would have been easy and also probably slightly cliched and incredibly lazy to have talked to you last Saturday because it was the International Day of uh, Persons with Disabilities, the sort of the annual commemoration, celebration, I guess, depending who you're, or you're talking to. Um, but I felt it was quite good just to maybe talk to you a couple of days after because then we could talk about that broadest sense of activism when it comes to, you know, disability and disability rights and stuff, and maybe some historical conversations, but also bringing it really up to date with the way that social media has allowed disability rights mm -hmm. activists uh, and campaigners to use social media. And I know that you've been doing some research and following some really interesting, innovative and cutting edge ways of using social media with people that you've been looking at TikTok and Twitter and Instagram and stuff like that. So we'll mm -hmm. cover that. And then I'd like to finish with um, just talking about sort of generous um, activism in its general sense, if you like, you know, what does it mean to you? Well, actually, what I'll do, I'll start with that. So if I was to say to you, someone is an activist, what would you assume they would do? Well, I suppose it's also activist and ad advocate is actually what a lot of kind of disability people referred to as well. And I think it's about just trying to give an opinion that isn't the mainstream and try and make it the mainstream is what I think. And and just having, yeah, just people's experiences and um, just trying to sort of raise the consciousness of it widely. I think people only really get, you know, activated, I suppose you would say, because they really passionately believe in something or they see an injustice or a wrong. Um, and I think that's sort of ultimately um, kind of what I think of activism, but I I'm sure um, other people, including uh, Dr. Paul Riley, would probably be able to do a different terminology for that one as well. Well, the, the good thing about it is we, we, I put a definition up of activism on day one in the blog post, which in, in, in its broadest sense, it's either a political or a social issue that mm -hmm. is vigorously came, campaigned for. Um, and obviously, you know, the government's got this bill that may or may not go through around sort of, you know, the volume of noise that you have at a protest. So I guess it depends how vigorous you wish to press your point uh, in, yeah. in a protest. But I think also it comes down to each individual. There was a few people I was talking to about participating in this program just saying, well, I don't see myself as an activist. And it's really interesting as if like activism is, I don't know, extreme. Obviously, we've got some extremes of that at the moment where people gluing themselves to road signs, climbing um, road infrastructure, maybe people throwing things at um, artwork in order to, you know, almost mm -hmm. like a, an extremist act, blocking roads. A lot of people will not take that kind of direct action. Mm -hmm. And other people are just happy to follow social media and maybe just do their bit or do a podcast. Or I guess we do that sort of talking to people. The thing you recently did with, you know, Concern Northern Ireland, yeah. Concern Worldwide, you know, those kind of things about just raising voices ultimately mm -hmm. taking yourself away from being a passive receiver of information about an issue to advocate in as you said or you know being active in sharing your opinion and your thoughts and people that you know people then look to you to have that voice it's it's open to the individual isn't it no no very much so but I also think it is important to get individuals involved I mean 
yeah, obviously with the disabled people's movement, a lot of that was originally about just having basic rights, basic accessibility rights. And people then did glue themselves to and uh, chain themselves into buses because they couldn't properly get into them or, or onto the front of them and everything. So I think, you know, people probably think of that as activism, but but that's also kind of quite exclusionary, particularly for people with disabilities, if you can't physically get down to a space or something. Um, and yeah, activism, I suppose a lot of people do automatically think of the extremes, but I think actually it can be a lot wiser than that, uh, particularly because of social media nowadays. And um, and I think with a lot of the sort of disabled people's movements, um, I think very much bringing people together as a collective from all different places and having a I mean, disability is such an umbrella term and we've often talked about. And I think this is a way for those voices who aren't the white bloke in a wheelchair kind of thing can actually get out there and say something and to um and just reach out to others um but it can but yeah the social justice thing is really important and just seeing how it has kind of moved online has been really interesting because uh there was a really big thing i was talked about it before back when the welfare reform bill was going through in 2010 um the spartacus report was was written about the impact of these cuts on to disabled people and like with the changing of DLA to PIP and everything and that was a really good sort of source of bringing people together though ultimately they weren't as successful so I think a, a lot of these issues as well just sort of roundabout coming back to, to what we were talking about at the start um, often I think we still have these voices though because there hasn't ultimately been change or it's been sort of piecemeal or or it's been eroded which is what we've kind of found which what the Spartacus report was about then um, but also I think activism is really important that individuals get involved because particularly within a lot of disability um, organisations are the big charities, the bit, you know, the original charitable model. Uh, and I think it's really important that individuals kind of talk about their experience rather than it just being people who are involved in charities who might not even have a disability themselves. Yes, I guess that's the other thing, isn't it? It's um, do people have lived who have lived experience or are living with a with a, a condition or a disability have equity at the table within some of the organizations that mm -hmm. represent them and i don't mean as in a focus group or an advisory board i'm talking about actually decision making right to the senior exactly. level of the board structure i mean i'm not saying that people can't be an ally of people with disabilities i mean um you're an ally of people with disabilities and, and lots of people are and I think that is a really key part of the experience and stuff as well to have that but it is also I mean the big mantra from historically from the disabled people's movement is nothing about us without us and I think that is still really really current nowadays and it's very easy for governments to kind of give money to the big charities and sort of say you know job you know job done we've kind of give, done our bit for the, the charitable movements and stuff but I think it needs to go much wider than that and particularly in the current climate with with the way kind of the cuts are happening even some of the big charities might not actually be able to step forward anyway so it is this kind of ever evolving process of of kind of what disabled people need and how we can move forward with that yeah I was talking to uh interviewing um Delta who's a young year two university student here journalism student and I was talking about trans activism during our interview and I was saying what makes an ally you know because uh, and we were just laughing about you know hey if you wear a ribbon you know that's acknowledgement but is that an ally you know what I mean you know are you standing up for yeah trans rights and you know trans rights are human rights you know everyone's seen mm -hmm. that in the posters because if you don't call that stuff out now that is playing out exactly a conversation i had last week with someone about you know domestic violence um, and some of the mm -hmm. different kind of adverts we're seeing on television now with like you know calling your mate out if he's saying something to someone in a park i think you know that kind of stuff you know when you're out you know call your mate out now for the language that they're that they're using social media is being used very effectively i think for some of these campaigns but until you stand up yourself it's not about, you know, I agree with you or whatever. It's about you've kind of got to get involved that really being an ally from Delta's perspective was, you know, talking to someone with mm -hmm. uh, with experience of, you know, going through um, being trans and, you know, the, the kind of the wars that they come up against, that kind of 10 year wait for some of the medical support that's mm -hmm. um, being advocated for from the NHS. And I guess also if you talk to some of the people 
um, that I've been lucky enough to meet over the years of doing Citizens Eye in their dot media centre. I'm sure you're the same from the early days of the disability movement, you know, where it was about getting the Disability Act. And then whatever kind of legislation comes along, people go, oh, that's it, sorted. You know what I mean? Mm. And, and whereas, in fact, getting the act is the time that you should act and actually start using it and holding people to account. Mm -hmm. um, it's really interesting, isn't it? Do, do, do you think there's an element of people now just thinking because there's a disability act that people are included? I guess it's a bit like you know, saying that uh, there's, a, there's an older person's act, so therefore you're not going to be discriminated against work. There's an act for you being all right you'll be okay John you'll always get a job John it's okay <laughs> and then, then you come up against the reality of it mm -hmm. no it's true no that is really true actually we look at this accessibility with you know with the Equality Act and the DTA before that and stuff spaces are supposed to be public spaces are supposed to be fully accessible um, but even now there are the exclusions to it or there's sort of it's technically accessible, but actually something needs to happen to make it accessible, such as somebody come out with a portable ramp or you have to go all the way. We've talked before about going all the way around the back and kind of. Pressing the bell. The, yeah. yeah with the bell. The, we'll let you in. You go, well, yeah, I'm exactly. going to get in without pressing the bell. Yeah. Exactly. Or you kind of, there's a disabled toilet, but they're using it for the storage. So actually you've got a, it's not actually accessible because the space that you need is being used for a different purpose. And, well, obviously, disabled toilets is a whole different thing about people sort of um, not recognising it for what it is. They just see it as as something, I'll just be a minute kind of thing. The same with parking. But it is tricky because, well, you can, you can move across with other social movements. Obviously, we were just talking about domestic violence. There's lots of acts there, but ultimately that does unfortunately still continue. Um, but I think the way society changes, it's really important that, the legislation and the perception of things changes. I mean, looking at terminology and language, how much that's changed over the last sort of 10, 20 years, or even the last five years or so, that's really important. And I think it's always a continuing process. And yeah, it's, it's such a long such a long thing. But then we've still got um, one of the big campaigns originally for disabled people's rights was against the telethon. Um, the, the piss on pity, as it was actually called, is what the disabled people's movement called it, to kind of say against, we don't want that. And yet we've just had children in need a few weeks back. And there was some really interesting stuff I did actually see online about people's perceptions of that. There's um, there's a, a great kind of um, advocate and uh, ambassador on Insta and TikTok called Tina Tame, and she has a, a son who's also got a disability. And, and just the idea that... Um, we still, oh, it's okay, we still need to raise money for these poor disabled children when actually they are individuals and uh, and why are we still doing this? What, what's the need for this? Surely things should already be in place. You shouldn't have to rely on a charity to pick up the things that should already be there. I guess that's the thing in 2022, is it? Why, why are we still doing these things? Mm. Um, you know, I know, I know, for example, you know, Tina and I often talk about, um, you know, live aid whenever the kind of the live aid thing comes up with someone you know I mean I guess Christmas time as well with the, with the song yeah. <laughs> let's not sing it shall we um I'm sure it'll be played somewhere in a shop that we'll go into later but um <laughs> that kind of has it changed since then has much mm. changed and it appears really that it hasn't because we're yeah. still having the same conversations about the effectiveness of international development and foreign mm -hmm. aid and, um, you know, that the kind of the global north or the Western world's approach to supporting people and how it views Africa. Well, it's exactly the same with, as you said there, with telephone, isn't it? How we view people. We're still happy to frame disability around blue badges um, and, exactly. uh, vis and the wheelchair, the kind of the physical outward appearance to the world which is like you know you need to give me a bit more space if you don't have those two things the blue badge or the wheelchair then you're you're, you're kind of fair game just to be treated like everybody else well yeah that's just it I mean everybody's infected so individually as we just said but something also that I've really seems to be getting a lot more speed which I think is really important I know we've talked before about hidden disabilities and variable disabilities and stuff and I think that's something that now needs to we need to move forward and, and kind of be much more aware of um, like with a vet and uh, actually some of the, with the variable disability is what I was going to say. And again, there are, there's some really great activists online talking about people who are ambulant disabled, but need to use a wheelchair as well. And I think people very much see uh, wheelchair users as people whose legs just 
don't work at all when actually it's it's a much more of a sort of it's not as cut and dry as that sort of people and then, uh, there's, a, and then there's this miracle when you rise up to do something I know goes. I know I've actually had friends before have been looked at and just gone it's a miracle kind of thing just because some people were staring at them and stuff you know and it's terrible you know like um but people have this perception and just because you know, today your legs work and tomorrow, well, you, you, today you can, you need to use a wheelchair because you're in a lot of pain or you're very fatigued or, you know, you're just not having a good day or your spasms and more. And then the next day you think, actually, I can get by with my crutches. It shouldn't be seen that they're fraudulent. I mean, they're disabled experience. They're still as disabled the second day. It's just, they're getting about in a different way. And that's really, really important. And, um, but yeah, there's some really, been really, great sort of activists talking about that is sort of disabled Eliza who is brilliant at kind of raising awareness on so many different levels um there's uh, Nina Tame again who's been great chronic explorer who kind of goes out and about and shows kind of the world and um as well as sort of climate activism um and sort of talking about how some days she needs to use her electric wheelchair but other days not and I think that's really, really important that people realise it's not just a stat. Disability isn't static. It is something that does flow day to day, I think. Yeah. And we'll, we'll put some of those in the, yes, in the blog definitely. post. Um, Brilliant. We'll, we'll put this film into as well so people can find out and research it themselves. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, the recent um, Lyme Museum that we've had here with mm -hmm. Dr. Angela Stein that she's founded about her hidden disabilities and that kind of materiality mm -hmm. of yes. invisibility exactly. and stuff. It's really interesting having various people come in and view it as well, um, mm -hmm. both allies and those with, with lived experience. Because what everyone was saying was that, you know, particularly the flat lays, I think when you look at that, it's then not about how you look it's about the materials that you've got you know mm -hmm. that, and then when you look at these flat lays you've got all of these various conditions and disabilities and stuff like that and like you said some people have got type one type two and then other people have got endometriosis you know what i mean and then they've got this and they've got lime and and there was ms me you know the whole kind of you mm -hmm. know then if some one person who's got lime has got all of these conditions like neurological conditions and then someone's only got Lyme, yet Lyme isn't recognised by the the communities from different places around the world, where therefore you have to kind of campaign to get something and then they'll treat you for this, but not the other conditions. And the flat lay was great because it was about sort of pressure mats, how many of those there were, or they were reading the same books, you know what I mean? And then um, the sort of things that they have to take with them when they go out. And I think mm -hmm. it was really interesting to see that because it represented it in a very different way about I can be someone with a medical condition and care about the climate why can't i yeah, exactly. the climate campaigner doesn't define you and being a disability rights activist doesn't define who you are it's about you are who you are and you're interested in those subjects exactly yeah social just... media gives you that opportunity to be that doesn't it exactly and i think also it's just you're not just you don't just care about one thing you're not just identified in one way you know everybody is a nuanced individual and I don't see why disabled people shouldn't also be seen as as a nuanced individual I mean I hope people don't look at me and just think about disability I hope they see me as a um a person and as a woman and all these sort of other aspects of, of life and that I care the other aspects I care about and stuff and um I think that's ultimately kind of really really important and but then also when you perceive people I think um and sort of seeing people as individuals I think it is also getting past that kind of pitiful gaze and um and just sort of the language that people use and, and with the people you're with I mean uh, again there's been sort of really interesting things uh, recently about um how people um sort of perceive somebody's partner who who's dating somebody or married to somebody with a disability and and sort of how they're um sort of perceived like is the partner a, a set sort of taking on somebody with a disability and being in their relationship with them and um and I think that's kind of quite disempowering as a disabled person because it's like the person loves me for me they don't love me just you know not despite my disability it's just another characteristic you have just as much as you know having hair or something it's just really really important that that kind of whole breadth and nuance is, is sort of taken into account now we've just done a really broad brush stroke there <laughs> yeah. in that sort of 20 minutes how do you decide as someone who is going to advocate for not only your rights but the rights of others through the work that you've done through citizen advice bureau and um, a new role which we'll talk about in a moment that you've taken on as well how do you decide what to get involved in because sometimes 
I look at the world and think, actually, we could do that. We could do that. We could do that. And you end up doing, there's too much to do. So therefore you think about what is it that I need to do? Do you have like a, a matrix or oh, is, is that giving it far too much? Like <laughs> thought that you've got this thing that you fill out that you turn around and go, actually that deserves some of my time because we're still talking about your own condition and your own energy levels and, Maybe we'll touch on the spoon theory with my revelation of that. Why you were called Spooky <laughs> yeah. Sarah on on, uh, on, on the Instagram? On, yeah, on Instagram. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I don't know. That's tricky, isn't it? I mean, I think um, I think I've always been kind of quite a a social social justice advocate. But I think what really kind of got me started was what I talked about before the kind of the 2010 the welfare reform bill and how like a lot of rights were being taken away like the independent living fund being taken away which enabled people to be independent to live independently and how a lot of the structures that disabled people had fought really hard for were taken away but I think for me it's also continued because then when I went sort of back to university and I did a master's and got involved with the disabled um, students um network and I was disabled students officer and I think you sort of recognize that um I don't know it's just it's just something you you feel really passionate about and I think if you care about something then as you said earlier on you know if you care about something don't just say you care about it say it and do something about it because it's about but yeah it is hard sometimes to choose what can you do I mean there's so many things I would wish I had all the energy in the world to kind of kind of advocate about and do a lot more of but often it is just I suppose you have to choose your battles with a disability but then I kind of um hope that I can do more than just one thing as well it's tricky it's a tricky question that one that is uh yeah because I'm event. again I guess what I was what I'm kind of getting you to get towards obviously is the role that you've just recently taken on which is around <laughs> yeah, disability hate crime is it in schools isn't it um, and, and covering well, school stuff as well and I just think you know sometimes it's getting involved in something that also involves talking to young people and educating young people as Tina always says is a good way of doing mm -hmm. something that's about any of those issues whether it's period poverty or whether it's climate mm -hmm. change or journalism whatever because they're still at the age where they're open to new things or you mm -hmm. know they're malleable to they've not got entrenched in the way of the world whereas you talk to someone my age or older you just think well what is it they could get involved in that's ever going to change anything? At least with young people, hopefully in 20 years' time, they're going to be the ones that are going to be the sort of, you know, mm -hmm. the middle to upper managers that can bring about some of this change in an organization, which is don't build that, you know, do this. Why aren't we including people? No, that's is right. Yeah, the organ the charity is I and Me Scotland, who um who are great and they were originally set up to help against uh to sort of fight against this disability hate crime as the founder kind of um saw a documentary online about well on the on the tv i should say rather than online um about um some of the some disability hate crime crimes that had happened and how awful it was and make crime because often um a lot of disabled people might uh, are kind of abused in that way by people who pretend to be friends and helping them actually yeah. end up kind of like using their flat for um for, for other purposes or their stuff. or their uh or their benefits as an open wallet for a night out yeah. exactly that exactly i've seen i've um, seen that here actually yeah. oh wow wow yeah well it's, i think it's also tricky when people know what day your benefits go in they kind of knock on then and say oh we you know we know today you've had your benefits can you give us your money kind of thing and it's awful mm -hmm. um but yeah the, one of their big projects is is about going into schools uh and sort of training other ambassadors and people with disabilities to go in and and just try and and uh, yeah, speak to uh, kids and just talk about disability. Because I think as I was talking to them about last week, often with disability, people don't like talking about it. And often adults, if a child asks something, they say, oh, no, no, no. You know, if, they, if you hear a comment when you're out and about, about oh, why are they in a wheelchair or something? And often the adult will shush them. So there's almost that kind of shame side of it in a way, or something we shouldn't talk about whilst with them by going in and actually speaking to people from that age because I think yeah kids very much are a product of their of their kind of upbringing and their environment and I think it's really important that we do talk about kind of and also the breadth they also I and me don't just focus just on one aspect but they've also doing these really great little animations of all different types of um, disabilities and how they impact people and they're hoping to kind of do more and more I'll put all the links up don't worry uh, so people can go and have a look at all these aspects and I just think yeah it's just really important that much as you can you can speak to adults and everything, you're right, the next generation are the way forward. And a lot of the young 
sort of uh, advocates online now through sort of on social media and on TikTok, sort of young disabled people, because they had a different basis when they were children. That's now flown, sort of flowed forward into adulthood. But you do need to look wider than just people with disabilities to talk about disabilities, I think. Um, but again, it's that like advocacy. And as you said, like if you tell kids and talk to them about sort of disability hate crime and say, look, this is these terms are offensive. Um, these sort of, um, you know, these behaviours are offensive. And then hopefully if they see that they will call it out and actually sort of stop it at the source then as well. So that was quite a roundabout way of talking no, about no, it no, it's but great. it is I mean, just yeah. really important though and I mean as uh, with the thing that Tina and I did a few weeks back for educating men on uh, gender equality and I think ultimately it is about educating everybody is is ultimately the kind of the way forward and I think that's really important with any sort of social movement aspect I'm sure your sort of trans rights activist student would very much sort of say the same thing as well it is about just talking about it and talking to people who I know children are just, yeah, just so important to talk. Um, well, I think children, about. children, young people, and particularly young adults, um, you know, social media and and their ability to create content about them and their life and their view of the world is probably something that in the last ten years is is we're still finding and shaping and developing as a society because suddenly they didn't need adults to advocate for them mm. anymore. They need those adults to maybe make the laws and open some of those doors and all that. But, you know, someone who was, I don't know, 10, 10 years ago is now has been grown up using social media is now 20 exactly, yeah. for 10 years. They've been able to share who they are for the first time. That is an equity mm in the in the debate because suddenly i've got evidence of 10 years of what living in this society in the way it operates is like so mm -hmm. now for the next 10 years how can i use social media as a young adult getting up going out into the world maybe leaving university or you know going to college or going straight into work why can't i work you know why why are there certain kinds of work that i can do um i think it's really important that we raise those voices. I know as uh, an organisation in Million Voices, it's called, isn't it? And um, great organisation in New Zealand, the work that they're doing around relationships with, you know, young, young adults with Downs and, you know, getting married and having a life and stuff like mm -hmm. that. You know, it shouldn't just be um, the undateables as the thing that defines young adults with disabilities, mm -hmm. you know having a normal life or a life or what is a normal life you know it's, it's having choices to do what you want to do isn't it you know? exactly well there's a whole other debate about the, the term normal and what is and isn't normal I'm sure we could probably talk for another hour and a half about that one or something yeah, yeah. but never, uh, met a, but actually... never met a normal person yet <laughs> <laughs> true true but um it's funny you um you mentioned that as well because um I am me they've actually one of their animations is about uh, Down syndrome and they've actually got it voiced by uh, a child with uh, Down syndrome and also they spoke to a lot of sort of kids um sort of about them and the and the way the animation set up is it, you know it's just very very accessible for children but their training also they can do and tailor it to the different ages of a child and different sort of key stages and stuff and I think that's sort of really important but but just having these sort of things is um yeah I mean the work they do is fantastic I'll definitely kind of put all the links down and stuff for you <laughs> brilliant so final thing I want to talk to you about really um politics dominates everything mm -hmm. particularly in the UK at the moment we even mentioned Brexit at the beginning didn't we? even though it was not necessarily anything to do with our conversation it kind of dominates <laughs> all conversations these days and I was just thinking, just preparing for our conversation, really, about the amount of people that are either registered disabled in the UK or affected by uh, some kind of health condition. And of course, now we've got COVID and long COVID and all that kind of stuff that comes with that. Mental health. You know, we can talk about mental health a lot more. Now I'm talking mm -hmm. to Julian tomorrow about mental health activism. Isn't it? Do you find it strange that any of the political parties, I'm not going to pick on anyone in particular, but any of the political parties don't have a con or don't seem to have a conscious effort to not so much play to the disabled crowd or play the disabled ticket or placate that crowd. But the fact that, you know, it doesn't matter what your health condition is in your life, you know, you're able to to vote, you know, you're a voting age and therefore you're going to vote someone 
as much as white van man might vote for his pocket in Basildon in Essex for someone who's going to put more money in his pocket, you're going to vote for someone that's going to help with care costs and all these kind of things, which wouldn't normally affect people. I mean, it's one of the interesting things about the displays downstairs. You're saying, well, look, you know, look at the amount of money each of those flat lays are. And the chances are no one's getting any of those meds for free. So actually to have a, a health condition means that there's, there's a financial uh, aspect to it as well. Oh, that's the whole other thing. Yeah, definitely. Just the, um, how much more expensive it is to have a disability. And that's originally why we had like DLA and such forth put in. That's really important. And just sort of how different that can be across the world and stuff. There's, um, there's a, a really great, um, sort of woman who, um, Jill Castle, who's stoma chameleon on Instagram, and she has a stoma because of a uh, birth injury, like when she was giving birth to her child and stuff. But she actually now kind of raises money to send stomas and stuff to Kenya because obviously they don't have the facilities that we have here. And I think very much um, it is expensive to have a disability to, to talk of that aspect. Um, yeah, it is like to buy a pack of ch chopped carrots is a lot more expensive than buying a carrot, which is often my sort of thing but it is just sort of the political parties engaging with disabled people I mean obviously I think certain within obviously a lot of the big changes that have happened have very much been politically based and obviously I did my dissertation on the impact of PIP on um, the change from DLA to PIP and the impact on the uh, right to independent living under the UN uh, sort of CRPD and it is um obviously from they, it's an ideological purpose where things are almost going back to the charitable model and i think a lot of certain more right-wing parties well the conservative party obviously did a lot of that stuff i might as well sort of just mention it and i don't know why they don't engage with the disabled community but maybe they think that they just won't ever vote for them so they kind of don't really sort of see the need to advocate or to produce stuff i mean I mean, Labour does have like a um, a disability members arm and, and they're kind of like very much more proactive with these things. But I don't know. I always find it very sad, though, that people um, don't engage with a community because they think they won't vote for them. And surely if the whole point of politics is to advocate for the wider population and to govern, to support all aspects of society. And if they don't vote for you, I don't see why you shouldn't sort of at least support them. But then even just doing the voting, um, it can be very very difficult for a disabled person to go down to do the vote. Mm. Um, obviously, you can do the postal voting, but there was a really big movement in the States called Crip the Vote, trying to get disabled people out to actually engage with sort of elections and to actually kind of place their ballot boxes. But if you're, say, living in a sort of a, a sheltered accommodation or in a care home or something, and you don't have somebody to take you down to do the vote or to help you arrange a postal vote, then that does disenfranchise you. And um, and I think I, I'll have to look at the stats actually, but it'd be really interesting to see what the stats are, if there are any out there about how many disabled people vote in, in general, in sort of accordance with the wider population. But um, there's a massive political debate we could have about this. Uh, like the triple lock on pensions, a lot of pensioners tend to support the conservatives and often that's why we have a lot more support for disabled people, for um, older people rather than for disabled people and why working age benefits have been cut and pension age benefits haven't. And I think that is very political, but obviously I'm sure a lot of people would argue against that one as well. Yeah, because you've got this sort of like the, the, it was the coalition as well. It wasn't just the. Talk. It was the coalition. I know. No, no, I'm saying it's just important that we, we bear in mind that you know we don't let those guys off the hook. The other party, the minor oh, no, party, not at all. they were they were part of that coalition that at that time declared war on people with disabilities because mm -hmm. there, there was nothing short of that. You know, because there've no, been casualties. Wasn't. You know, um, even yeah. if it's people taking their own life, they're, they're they're worried and they're casualties of those of those things. While at the same time having a a high profile schmooze campaign about the Paralympics in London. Exactly. And, you know, so it suit that kind of you know superhero stuff like that, and, it, and you know, and it's it's hard to give Channel Four a hard time about that because you've got the last leg and you know this way of viewing Paralympians and I guess you've got the Invictus Games that's come along and done that as well but if sport isn't your thing you should still be treated with respect and have access and opportunities to engage life not just about how sport has helped you I mean, in, in exactly and it can be very disempowering because people use the super crip example mm. as somebody who if they can do it why can't you do it or something and it's like well no that 
that specific person um you know is able to do that but just because somebody else with the same condition can't and and the way the kind of um the the different sort of um levels and sort of uh, within paralympic sports that can be the, the sort of the classes that can be really really kind of quite there's been a lot of argument about well why is that person being placed in that class when actually they can do this and how do you kind of level it up properly and stuff but whole classification yeah. thing yeah exactly yeah yeah it's really um that, that's sort of another can of worms as well but but yes i know the liberal democrats were very much involved within a lot of the welfare reform bill sort of um, introductions and I know they, they they like to say now that they help to tone down some aspects but I think that is very tricky when you did sort of the, these massive cuts and I know um, <clears throat> Ed Davey does actually is a sort of an ally of people with disabilities because of his sort of uh, family but it is very tricky when you do look at historical sort of changes that were introduced and a lot of um, and how stuff was really cut right back at that time. Um, it is very, very, yeah, I do get very frustrated about a lot of those aspects as well. But yeah, disability is just, it's just important just to talk about it, even just doing this, just talking about it and yeah. and just sort of um, sort of making people think that it is such a huge umbrella term. Just don't be afraid to ask questions. And, and also if you're worried about language or something, ask the disabled person you're talking to interactive ask them kind of how you know about themselves and how they wish to be described and such forth um i think that's really really important that there's actually been quite a few blogs about that recently as well online about you know if in doubt just ask the person and i think ultimately that is um the way forward in a lot of aspects in life and and it can be someone who is willing to have that conversation with you and you know is trying to kind of like live their best life if you like but then you've mm -hmm. also got those that are even more marginalized because of their disability because of cultural issues or their religion mm -hmm. or you know their, their their ethnicity where they've come from to come to the uk that you know people are hidden away and so yeah. they're, all, they're almost even more invisible can you be even more invisible i'm not sure if you're invisible you're not seen if you can can you be more than invisible well yes i think you can to be yes, honest definitely. It's like I mean, you don't exist you know exactly particularly now if you, you can't live independently so you're in a, a care home effectively as a young person you're very much invisible now because you know you can't get out and about and you lose some of your benefits then because you're in a care home and it's a whole other sort of um can of worms really i suppose but then i, I sort of say just ask people but obviously be very aware that a disabled person isn't a spectacle they're not a public person and I sometimes find it very frustrating when people ask me you know what have you done to your leg and stuff when actually that's not really relevant I think it's just more if um, a lot of the things online were about when people are writing about disability and they're quoting somebody ask them how they want to be referred to as and I think that's really important but it is that nuance it's important to ask but don't do it just because you're nosy either <laughs> sounds terrible but well because you want to blog about it and put it on your socials like yeah. hey I, I met <laughs> exactly I, I met someone with a disability today it was so empowering for me in my day. it's so yeah. inspirational to hear about their lives and I think this about them and isn't that wonderful what they do and you know and they've got this really supportive partner who helps to enable their life and you're just like no <laughs> yeah. it's always slightly unnerving when you meet people who are part of their five a day is to go out and meet someone who's trans and then someone who's got a disability and someone from a different ethnic community <laughs> that's not your five a day that's not what it's about you've completely got that wrong but i saw it on a trend i thought i'd go out and do it on social media <laughs> exactly. Listen, Sarah, it's, yeah, it's great to talk to you thank you for taking you the too. time um mm -hmm. and i like talking to you often because I think there's always things that are kind of playing out um, all the time um, within within the movement in, it, in its broadest sense. Mm -hmm. And again, just, you know, encouraging people to be an activist or an advocate um, mm -hmm. and to use social media in a positive way for their voice to be heard. And again, you know, it, follow some of the people that you can recommend mm -hmm. to us so we, we get closer to the people that are trying to do something positive. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I'd be more than happy to talk about any of this. And if we wants to get in touch to if they want to have a similar conversation, then I think both of us would be quite happy to facilitate that as well. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Thank you.